Okay, good morning. It's now time to begin. Welcome to our class together. Good to see you and good to see you in person. Uh, even though we have some cold uh, snow flurries going on, but uh, it's still a beautiful day. I was telling somebody before class, I feel sorry for the farmers in the area who have these cherry orchards. And I hope they don't get hit too hard the next couple nights. It's supposed to be pretty cold. Somebody said, uh, not tonight, but the next night, maybe down to about 18 degrees. That's, that's going to be cold. So we need the Department of Agriculture around here. We're studying in the books of uh, Ephesians and Colossians, and today we're in Colossians chapter 4, so you may want to be turning there. We, I'm hoping we can finish up chapter 4, which is the final chapter in Colossians, then drop back and pick up uh, the remainder of Ephesians. There's, there'll be some overlap here, which will be good, sort of some reinforcement of some of the material that he covered here in, ch in the fourth chapter of his letter. So if you're ready, we'll start. Roger, would you lead us in a word of prayer, please? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee, Father, for our families and means of making a living. And we thank thee now that we can come together to worship you. We'd ask thee to be with Brother Bob as he presents the message and be with us as listeners and, and maybe we have questions and comments. Be with those that are ill, give them strength and be with them if, if it be thy will. Be with us, Father, as we go into this class. In Christ's name, amen. I did want to mention, Chris asked me to announce, to just remind everybody that there will be a meeting about VBS after services this evening, immediately after services. So you are encouraged to stay for that and be part of the planning for Vacation Bible School. Okay, Ephesians, or Colossians chapter 4, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3 at the very end. Let's, let's pick up at verse 18. I want to drop back to verse 18. We'll just read these few verses and then get into the new material there beginning in chapter 4. Uh, verse 18, he says, Wives, be in subjection to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, there was a question last week I wanted to come back to about the word bitter. And uh, some of the translations have be not harsh, which I think also carries the idea. I looked up the word bitter, uh, the original Greek word there, and of course in the, in the uh, lexicon, uh, it gives the meaning uh, bitter. <laughs> Be not bitter against them. Uh, I'm not sure if, you'll, if this would help or not, but I found this comment by Brother Lipscomb on this phrase. He says, uh, about husbands love your wives, he says, in the beginning it was said, quote, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh, Genesis 2.24. Husbands must love and cherish their wives, promote their good, happiness, and welfare. The apostle says, quote, even so ought husbands also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his own wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as Christ also the church. Nevertheless, do ye also severally love each one his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see that she fear her husband. That's Ephesians 5, 28 through, uh, through 33. And then Brother um, Shepherd appended these comments to that. He said, the Christian husband is to accept his place of headship as a sacred responsibility put upon him by God himself and is to exercise authority for the blessing of his home in the love of Christ. 
And just as some wives may be united to tyrannical and unreasonable men, so there are husbands who, after marriage, find that the one who in the days of courtship seemed so affectionate is a veritable termagant. Now, does anybody know what termagant means? I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> Have you ever heard that word? Oh, it's a great word. I looked that up. It means an overbearing or nagging woman. <laughs> or a shrew, S-H-R-E-W. So he says, uh, just as some wives may be united to tyrannical and unreasonable men, so there are husbands who, after marriage, find that the one who in the days of courtship seemed so affectionate is a veritable termagant and is unreasonable as it is possible to be. But still, the husband is to love and care for her, showing all consideration, as the apostle says, quote, giving honor unto the woman as unto the weaker vessel, as being also joint heirs of the grace of life, to the end that your prayers be not hindered. And of course, that's 1 Peter 3, 7. And be not bitter against them. God knew how petty and trying some women's ways would be when he said this. In the power of the new life, one may manifest patience and grace under the most trying circumstances and not suffer himself to become exasperated. So I don't know if those comments help or not, or, or shed any further light on, on that. Don, something else? And it applies generally to, uh, to all Christians. Okay, go ahead and read that if you would. That's Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you and all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, even as God in Christ forgave you. Good. I, th I think maybe the word kindness is a key there, isn't it? Uh, as the opposite of being bitter against somebody, showing kindness would be a requirement that we all have. But here he specifically puts that on the husband to be not bitter against their wives. Was well, there anything else? Does that help? Kim, you brought that up last time. Does that help? Is there any? synonyms to each other yeah I guess I guess if a husband is um, you know shows the kind of kindness towards his wife that Christ exhibited towards the church you see all harshness dis disappear and bitterness and and just just un uh, Christ-like in our approach and, and I think I thought brother um, uh, I guess it was Shepard's comment there was good in that um, a, a man who is married to a woman in the first century um, and the man becomes a Christian, but the woman, let's say she for some reason does not become a Christian or even maybe even... Uh, is antagonistic towards the church or towards the idea. You can see how, you know, that, that would put that man in a very trying circumstance, just like it would the other way around for the woman. But even so, we're not to be bitter or harsh against our, our wives and to recognize that, they, that, they, that there is a responsibility that husbands have that's placed upon them by God to be the spiritual leader or head of the household. And that's not always uh, an easy thing to do. So was there any other comment on that or anything further or question before we move on there? Of course, he, yes, Paula, go ahead. 
wait a minute, you may speak only if it is your birthday today. Um, I'm allowed to speak then. Uh, I think what we need to realize in this day is this happens in the church. Loving couples begin their marriage and we see so many of them separate and we really need to focus on that, I yes. think, now. Sometimes we look and say, well, back, back then, they, you know, the husbands threw away their wives and wives didn't have power, but it still happens. Uh, actually, it happens in a different way today, and maybe it's sadder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it happens probably with greater frequency. Uh, I've seen the statistics on this in our own country since the 1960s, mid-60s, early 60s, uh, the divorce rate in this country has just skyrocketed. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a need for this kind of teaching and uh, reinforcement of how we're to treat one another. Yes, Don. breakup of family. Uh, Suetonius, one of the uh, Roman writers, uh, wrote about uh, the marriage and divorce situation in Rome, and he talks about the man who was the 21st husband of his 23rd wife. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Well, keep these thoughts kind of in the back of your mind, if you would, because we'll come back to this when we get over into Ephesians 5 and 6. But I think we, we've sort of consulted those verses, but this, this is a prominent theme in the Word of God, certainly in Paul's epistles, and uh, needs to be stressed uh, repeatedly. He, he, of course, mentions children there again in verse 20 servants in verse 22, and I, and I mentioned that, the, that servants and the principles there I think may be applied to employees without doing any violence to the text. That's a, a principle that carries through. And finally, whatsoever you do, verse 23, he says, work heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that from the Lord ye shall receive the recompense of the inheritance. Ye serve the Lord Christ. So ultimately, all, that, all of these things, these relationships that we're in, in whatever form, we must remember that we're serving Jesus Christ and follow his will. These things will tend to work out. For he that doeth wrong shall receive again for the wrong that he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So again, a reminder that God is ultimately in charge and is the regulator, creator, and the regulator of uh, all of these relationships. In, in chapter 4, the first verse, he continues this, saying, Masters. Now, again, that's a reference to slave owners of the first century, but I think the principles apply in the master-servant context in the law uh, for employers or those who are in positions of authority. Render unto your servants that which is just and equal, he says, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So think about it. If, if you are a job foreman or a supervisor on a production line or in any sense responsible for the supervision of other people and the directing of their activities, just remember, he says, that you also have a master in heaven. Principles that, that would help us help us in, and apply. Yes, Don. In the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are two words that are often translated servant. Uh, diakonos, which we use for deacon nowadays, mm -hmm. and uh, the doulos, who was a bond servant. And the difference between them was that under the law, the diakonos was a paid servant. He had rights. He could complain. And, and go to law, but the doulos had no rights. He had no uh, standing under the law. He was simply a possession of the master. And so it's especially important when he says to be fair with them and to treat them properly. Yeah, yes. And I think 
doulos, the, the slave form, is what Paul often refers to himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, in our English translations, you may see the word bond servant for that, for that word. Yes. All right. He continues then toward the end of this epistle, and he kind of wraps this up, and he'll get into some personal directions that are helpful to us to notice. He says in verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, watching therein with thanksgiving, with all praying for us also that God may open unto us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer each one. A uh, couple of things here. Notice the emphasis upon prayer, continuing in prayer. Paul would uh, write to the Philippian congregation uh, to pray without ceasing. Uh, that is, let your entire continuing mode of conduct be a prayerful one. Be a prayerful person from day to day. Don't ever give up the habit of prayer. Don't cease in, in your prayer. But notice it's coupled with thanksgiving. Don't forget to give thanks in your prayer. It's not all about requesting things from God. Don't forget to express gratitude and thanksgiving in prayer. And then he specifically asks for their prayers. He says, with all Praying for us also, that is, we who are preaching, we like the Apostle Paul who was actually imprisoned for uh, preaching the gospel, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in bonds. So remember when Paul wrote this, this is one of the prison epistles, he was literally in a Roman prison, and uh, so he's saying that uh, he needs their prayers. And it would be good for them to pray for him, that he speak as he ought to speak. And don't, don't, don't slack off in preaching and teaching the gospel. Verse 5, when he says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. The word walk there is a figure for what? Stands for what? Behaving, Behaving living, con conducting oneself. And that's very typically used that way in the scriptures. Our Christian walk is our conduct as a child of, Christ, of God. Notice he refers to them that are without. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Who's that? Non-Christians. Them, those who are without or outside of Christ. Uh, Notice the, the constant emphasis in the word of God upon setting an example in the church for the benefit of those who are not yet Christians. Uh, never give non-members the opportunity to uh, criticize the church because of your conduct to badmouth the church and to say, oh, just a bunch of hypocrites because they're, they're seeing the way you really live. Paul says, now don't ha let that happen. Walk in wisdom, full of uh, wise perception about what's right and what's, what's not right. And then he uses this term, redeeming the time, which is a phrase that, that he uses twice here, Colossians 4, 5, and also in Ephesians 5, which we'll see to redeem the time, uh, Thayer says, means to make a wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good. You have the opportunity to do good, grab it. Make a wise use of that. Uh, the word redeem literally means to buy back. So it's like God has given us chances or opportunities we should, we should uh, buy them up, make a good use of them, redeeming the time. And let your speech, he says, verse 6, be always with grace. Uh, don't let your speech deteriorate into negativity, 
you know, being caustic, um, uh, you know, b being a person who always has a smart, smart aleck comment to make or something uh, that's, that's negative and hurtful. Let it always be graceful, uh, seasoned with salt. Now, what, why mention salt? What is salt? It's a preservative, and it also what? Flavor. It's flavor. It, it, it makes something taste good. It's a seasoning agent. And so let your, think of your speech that way. If you're in a meeting with six people, and you have the opportunity to speak, regardless of the subject matter, try to say something that will advance the conversation in a positive way. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Uh, I remember going to preacher's meetings years ago in the area, and there was one preacher in particular that I used to think, I wish he would say more. He didn't say a whole lot at the preacher's meetings, but when he did speak out, I always felt like it was something uh, helpful. By the way, his name was Warren Kenny. <laughs> I just wished that he would have spoke out even more than he did, because when he did say something in those meetings, I felt like it was uh, with grace, it was seasoned with salt, it, it advanced uh, the, the, uh, the good cause instead of, uh, you know, casting doubt or being negative and so on. Uh, but he says, let your speech be that way. Make sure you're the one in the room that we can count on to always say something constructive. Uh, that you may know how ye ought to answer each one. Okay? You know, if we answer our critics in a sort of a a challenging or bitter kind of way, in, in a way that is um, unpleasant. We're not going to advance the cause of Christ. In fact, if anything, we're going to set it back. It's, it's not just what we say, it's how we say it that matters. That's what Paul is indicating here, that you may know how to answer and not just what to say. Any thoughts on that? Questions? Comments? All right. Let's notice now some of these personal uh, observations. There's, there's going to be some names here that you, you're probably familiar with them, or at least we're familiar with some of them. Verse 7, he says, All my affairs shall Tychicus make known unto you, the beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for this very purpose, that ye may know our state, and that he may comfort your hearts. Okay? Tychicus will, is a faithful brother. He's obviously a supportive companion to the Apostle Paul. Um, turn over, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. This is in the... Uh, Third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul. Verse 4, Acts 20 and verse 4. And there accompanied him as far as Asia, Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secondus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. But these had gone before and were waiting for us at Troas. So, he, so this man was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, and you can see he's in some pretty good company here. These were uh, tremendous co-workers with the Apostle there. And Tychicus is mentioned... Uh, in several other places, 
Uh, in addition to Colossians 4 and verse 7 here, he's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 21, which we'll, we'll come to in time. But I'd like you to notice Titus chapter 3 and verse 12. Titus 3, 12. Paul here writing to Titus, the young man, young preacher, he says, when I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, give diligence to come unto me to Nicopolis, for there I have determined to winter. Here we learn that these men were trusted by Paul, that Paul could send them on an errand or a responsible duty. And then lastly, in 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse 12, 2 Timothy 4.12. He says, But Tychicus I sent to Ephemus. And he, he says this after he's indicated uh, about Luke being with him only. He says, Take Mark and bring him with thee. Remember, he's talking to Timothy, for he is useful to me for ministering. But Tychicus I sent to Ephesus. So again, Tychicus seems to have been one of Paul's go-to guys. He could send him on a mission of importance with confidence that he would, he would carry it out. And here he's saying Tychicus is going to bring you up to speed. He'll let you know uh, the, the, uh, what is going on with my affairs, verse 7, whom I've sent unto you for this very purpose that you may know our state. And this, of course, would bring comfort to them, knowing how Paul was doing, the strength of his spiritual state and, and uh, his ministry. And verse 9, he would be sent together with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. What else do we know about Onesimus? Who was he? He was a runaway slave, right? The book of Philemon is all about, you know, Onesimus, who was the slave, and apparently he had run away from his master and somehow came into contact with the Apostle Paul, and Paul converted him, taught him. And Onesimus, the slave, obeyed the gospel. And Paul sent him back in the company of was it Tychicus, uh, with, uh, to go back to his master, uh, Philemon. And that's what the book of Philemon is about. Together with Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother. And notice he says, who is one of you? Isn't it beautiful to refer to a slave, physical slave, as one of you? He's a, he's a Christian, folks. He's obeyed the gospel. He's, Paul is letting them know that here. Uh, with regard to Onesimus. Yes, Don. It's interesting that Onesimus, the name means beneficial or useful. Okay. The name Onesimus means beneficial or useful. Good. Thank you. Um, if you ever get a chance here, just, you know, in your study for this class, go back and read the book of Philemon. It's just a single chapter there. It's not, it's not long at all, what, 25 verses? But I think I said t he, went, he went back with Tychicus. I was just double checking. I, that, that may have been, I should have said Epaphras or Epaphras. And we'll talk about him a little bit more here in, in a moment. Okay, verse, uh, verse 10, if I can get this to an advance. No, maybe you guys can, oh, oh, there we go. There it is, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. Now, we've already just read about Aristarchus in the other context. He, said, he refers to him as my fellow prisoner. So Aristarchus was incarcerated along with the Apostle Paul. He salutes you and Mark. Cousin of Barnabas. What do we know about Mark Brown for this statement? He was the one who did what? 
He turned back, right? Remember that first missionary journey? Paul and Barnabas, and uh, they have John Mark. Now here the text says that he was the cousin of Barnabas. So being physically related, uh, it put Paul into a sort of a tricky circumstance because then on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along, you remember? And Paul thought not good to take the one who had turned back from them the first time. And the text says that a sharp contention arose between the two so that they parted ways. Barnabas took John Mark and went one way. Paul took who? Silas, right, on that second missionary journey, and he went the other way. So, uh, but here, by this time now, again, we're down to about 62 AD when this book is written. Here he, he is commending Mark. Apparently things have reconciled and worked out in a, in a good way. And he tells him uh, that he, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, salutes you. And he says, uh, if he come unto you, receive him. It's very likely that they had heard about the falling out that had occurred, and so when they hear about John Mark, they're thinking, whoa, should we have anything to do with him? Paul says, yes, when he comes to you, receive him. These differences have been worked out, and he is worthy of your support and your reception there at, uh, at Colossae. Verse 11, and Jesus, that is called justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, men that have been a comfort unto me. So Jesus here, who is called justice, I think the brother of Jesus, the brother of our Lord, half-brother, uh, sometimes went by that name, justice. This was not an uncommon name uh, at that time. Then in verse 12, he mentions Epaphras or Epaphras. Uh, who is one of you, a servant of, of Christ Jesus, saluteth you. We know something about Epaphras because of what's said next here. Always striving for you in his prayers, that ye may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. You know, if we didn't know anything else about Epaphras, that right there makes him the kind of person I'm looking forward to meeting someday. Because he spent his time praying for these brethren that they would be strong, that they would be uh, perfect, that ye may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he hath much labor for you and for them in Laodicea and for them in Hierapolis. These cities are all close together. They're in what was called the Lycus Valley. And... Uh, what happened in one often affected the others. So they're mentioned oftentimes together. All right, there in verse 13. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas salute you. Notice how he compliments and praises Luke as the beloved physician. Um, we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts, and we see Luke present in many of those so-called we passages in the book of Acts. He was right there with Paul so many times. He was trusted, faithful, <clears throat> and so Paul compliments him freely. He doesn't, say too, he doesn't say anything about Demas. He just says, Demas salutes you. It may be that by now... Uh, there might have been a little question in his mind about Demas. I don't know. Uh, what would Demas later do? He's the one that would forsake Paul. Only Luke is with me. Paul, remember, said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. It may be that even at this early stage, Paul was already beginning to see some things in Demas that just raised his eyebrow just a little bit. Verse 15, salute the brethren that are in Laodicea. Uh, again, this was a city that was close to Colossae. <clears throat> Ephesus, Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. These were all very close together. It would seem that when the apostle wrote a letter to one, 
It was expected that it be read in, in the other congregations as well. In fact, he may have actually sent <coughs> copies, sent, sent the original letter to the one and sent a copy to the others. That's very possible. And then he mentions uh, this brother Lympha, Nymphus and the church that is in their house, probably meaning the family of Nymphus, his, his household. Uh, they, they must have had a house large enough to accommodate the meeting of a congregation. Have any of you ever met in a house for service, for church services? Okay, may I ask for a show of hands? Oh man, a lot of you, a lot of you. Okay, not at all uncommon, and it certainly wasn't uncommon in the, uh, in the New Testament either. Can you think of somebody else in the New Testament who's referred to as hosting a congregation in their house? Who? Lydia. Lydia? Okay. Lydia, and there's somebody else I was thinking of, very similar to Lydia. Who? Philemon. Philemon. Yeah, that's not, again, that's not the one I was. How about Aquila and Priscilla? Remember Aquila and Priscilla? They had a, a church that was meeting in their house. They didn't have a church, but they were part of a congregation meeting there. And anyway, he says, uh, salute the brethren that are at Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that's in their house. And incidentally, that, that should teach us that the church is not the building, <laughs> right? The church is in their house, tells us that uh, that's a reference to the people who make up the body of Christ, the church. And he says, when this epistle hath been read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And that ye also read the epistle from Laodicea. Now some people believe that the letter to the church at Laodicea is a lost letter. That we don't have that letter. That may be. Or it may be that this is, like I say, it, it was Paul's intention when he wrote a letter, like the one to Ephesus, that it actually be circulated and read in different cities. Because if you look over in the book of Ephesians for a minute, look at uh, chapter 1 here, Ephesians 1, the way this starts, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God, to the saints that are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Some believe the way that's worded that it was not limited to the church at Ephesus that it was intended for all of those congregations in that Lycus Valley area. And that this may indeed be the epistle that Paul is talking about when he says, I want you to read that epistle, I want you to let them read this one. Okay. That would also make sense in that they are so similar and that they were written both at the same time or very, very close in time in about 62 AD, same prison term, Paul writes both of these letters. What he's saying is, I want you to read both of them. Okay. And verse 17, and, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. This is, sounds like a caution uh, to this brother Arch, Archippus. He might have been a member of the church there at Colossae. And what Paul is saying is, I want you to tell him specifically something. Tell him to take heed to the ministry which, that, which, that he's received in the Lord. Some job that he was given, some work that he had to do, Paul is saying, remind him to do that. Verse 18, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Remember my bonds, grace be with you. What does it mean, salutation? What is a salutation? If you letter writers, what is a salutation? Yeah, it's, it's a personal word. A lot of times at the end of our letter, we'll, we'll, we'll say something, uh, may, may the Lord be with you, or, or I am, I'm very truly yours, or something. Uh, you're basically saluting. It's a salutation. And uh, 
Paul evidently used what's called an amanuensis. That's a, like a, a, a secretary or scribe who would actually take his dictation. He would dictate his letters and they would write them down for him. But at the end, he would actually append something in his own handwriting sort of like a signature today. That way you could tell it was a genuine letter. So when he says the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand, that means you can see now this is me, I'm, I wrote this letter. Uh, remember my bonds. It's interesting, the one thing that Paul writes in his own handwriting is remember my bonds. Just remember I'm in prison. Did he mean by that? what I'm saying should have extra weight and authority to you. This should be very meaningful to you. I'm in prison writing this to you. Or was he, was he asking for their prayers, their thoughts and their support? I'm not sure. But anyway, he says, just don't forget that. I'm in prison here. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. That was typical of Paul to say. Uh, typical Gentile greeting of the day, grace be with you. And with that, he ends his beautiful epistle to the church at Colossae. Any other comments or questions down through the end of chapter 4 here? How's your chance? Don, go ahead. Yes, uh, I remember that too. Okay, so we're going to give a prize to the first person who can come up with that passage. What, what is that? Where Paul says, don't be embarrassed or discouraged because I'm in bonds. You remember that? Where's all these Googlers? Anyway, it's out there. Something similar to that, very similar. Well, I appreciate your, your following along and, and engaging in that study of the book of Colossians. We're going to, sw where is it? 2 Timothy 1.8. All right, 2 Timothy 1.8. Now, Kim, what is the secret for finding that? All right, good, all right. You said 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, which says, Be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but suffer hardship with the gospel according to the power of God. Good. Is that the one, Don, that you were thinking of? <laughs> See, Kim, now you may not be off the hook yet. Well, that's, that's a beautiful sentiment. And we have just a couple of minutes. Uh, flip over to Ephesians chapter 5 real quick if you would. Now we're going to move through the, some of this very rapidly because we've, we've been sort of consulting it as we went there in, in Colossians. Uh, there's a lot of overlap here. But still, the way Paul words things is, some, is a little different and it may give us a little different, better insight if you look at them both together. Verse Ch uh, 1 and 2 in chapter 5, he says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love even as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. All right? Imitators of God as beloved children. Look at the picture there that he's that he's painting. Um, children that really love their parents and are loved by their parents oftentimes want to be like their parents. And he's saying we are children of God, so let's imitate God. Let's try to be like him. And uh, we are beloved children. He loves us. And walk or conduct ourselves uh, in love just like Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us. Uh, the offering of a sweet smell, of course, harks back to the Mosaic sacrifices and even before the law of Moses, the animal sacrifices. 
And remember the altar of incense where the odor was perfumed and it reminded all of those worshipers about the importance of remembering that God was the one who was receiving this and, and observing it. Okay, for next week, if you would then read Ephesians 5. We'll plan to start there in verse 3. Ephesians 5 and verse 3. Thank you very much.